What's up, everybody? Welcome back to 90s Obscurity. Today, I have Kay Hanley from Letters to Cleo here. I'm very excited because I'm a huge Letters to Cleo fan, as you can probably <laughs> guess. We were just talking before the show. Um, I've seen them a bunch. I'm a fellow Bostonian as well. So, I mean, I've just loved you guys since high school. So thank you so much for coming on. Appreciate Thanks for it. having me, Rachel. That's really yeah. fun to hear. <laughs> yeah, I love it. So, um, Basically, what I want to talk about today, we're going to talk about Letters to Cleo, but also you just had the 20th anniversary of your solo record, Cherry Marmalade. So we are going to talk about that. We'll play some of those songs as well. Um, I want to first reference for anyone in the Boston area that's listening that Letters to Cleo is playing at the Paradise this Friday and Saturday. So November 18th and 19th. So definitely check them out because I've seen them a bunch. They're amazing live. And um, obviously you can find their music on Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, wherever you get your music. And also you can find Kay's solo albums there. So I'll do some social media plugs at the end and we can talk more about that. Um, but also what I thought was cool is that you have a remastered vinyl edition for sale of Cherry Marmalade, right? Yes, I do. It was a very rare moment of a very rare moment of thinking in advance on my part. So like last year, I some, somehow it occurred to me that Cherry Marmalade was turning 20 and I know how long it takes for vinyl. So I called my manager and I was just like, Hey, what do you think about doing something on vinyl? And he was like, great. So we got on cue and a year later we were ready to roll it out. Awesome. And it's so pretty too. I looked it up. It's all red and swirly and I, you know, I love pretty aesthetics. Yeah. So. <laughs> they do all that stuff now. It's like you, it you don't have to get, you know, your licorice pizza. You could, you know, it's just not a black disc, although I love that too. But, um, you know, you can get all these like beautiful, yummy colors for wine. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Well, I, I just had Glenn from Toad the Wet Sprocket on last week, and he has a purple one. He has a purple and an orange. And, I and like, they're just so pretty. I thought that was so neat. So you guys can get a copy of, if you want the <laughs> vinyl copy, it is at khanley.com. So check out her website. Uh, let's kick it off. I just want to briefly mention how funny that Roxy show was. So Letters to Cleo just played at the Roxy on Sunset last weekend. Has it, The power went out for anyone who wasn't there. And so <laughs> three songs in. On all of sense that the electricity went out, and so you guys are going to have to reschedule that, obviously. Um, has that ever happened to you before? No. No, nothing like that has ever happened to us. And you're just not expecting it. Like, five songs in, I think, it was like just all of a sudden, everything was got Like, the lights went off, the amps, guitars, mic, everything. And it was the kind of thing that you knew that it was probably a serious yeah. A serious outage. And it turned out that, you know, like three blocks of Sunset Boulevard were were blacked out. And then we got to do, uh, <clears throat> you know, that like little acoustic sing along for one song. Yeah. And then they were like, y'all got to get out of here. So we'll have to leave. <laughs> I know, but it was kind of a cute moment. Like it like blew up social media, I feel like, because everyone had, you know, was recording the sing along in the dark. So it was so cute. So guys, we all sang Cruel to Be Kind. <sighs> you know, everyone had their cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> It was a cute moment. It was very sweet. And I mean, that's kind of, I mean, I think for people, I think for people who've seen us a lot and there were some like, there were some like OG fans there for sure. Um, for I them, was one of them. <laughs> like they've seen us a bunch. And so like, and you're one of them. So mm -hmm. I think the fact that this happened and like, we will all, none of us will ever forget this show and that we all got to like meet each other and hang out on the side because the club wouldn't let us bring our guitars out on the sidewalk and finish the concert. So we just went outside and took pictures and I met you and like, mm -hmm. you know, we just hung out for an hour for as long as it would have taken to do the rest of the show. So. And that's so cool of you guys to do that. Like, I have to say it turned into, you know, what should have been probably a bad night, which was amazing because like you guys, can, you know, not all bands would do that. And just like, okay, we're going to come out on the sidewalk and hang out with our fans. And like, that was so cool that you did that. And I also <laughs> met Amber and Alex from Broken Baby and they were um, like such nice people, aren't they? The sweetest people. And we played with them in San Diego the night before. So I like, I watched half their show both nights and I was just like, yay, like such a, I'm a fangirl now. I yeah. Love them. Oh my God. Same. Um, but it was funny. So I posted the picture of us from that show and I got all these messages about Parks and Rec and I didn't get the joke because I don't watch that show. But apparently... Oh. Adam Scott had the, you know, you guys did the episode with Adam Scott where he's wearing the letters to Cleo shirt. I was like, I didn't, I don't yeah. get the joke, guys. Totally. <laughs> I thought 
found out this weekend that you, the band name came because you had a childhood pen pal named Cleo. That's right. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, and my friend was like, are you going to ask her if she still keeps in touch with Cleo? And I said, well, I am now because now we have to know. Yeah. Do you still keep in touch with Cleo? I do not. She was, um, she, I mean, we, she knows about the band and like, I, I corresponded with her brother on social media a couple of years ago. Um, but she, so my grandpa, uh, on my mom's side, uh, my grandfather, Joe Joyce, he owned a motel up in St. Peter's, which is, uh, in Nova Scotia. And, um, and so every summer we would drive from Boston to Nova Scotia and one of the kids in the neighborhood was Cleo and we played together every summer and then we would write letters to each other. Once we were old enough to write, we would write letters to each other all winter long and then we'd see each other in the summer. And so she was my pen pal, not just like once, but like for many, many years and, um, and also a playmate when I was, you know, when I would see her in the summertime. So she knows about the band, but you know, we have not corresponded or anything. That's, that's so funny. I would be embarrassed. <laughs> Why? Cause you named your band after her? She would just be like, what? yeah, exactly. It's just like, cause it wasn't really supposed to be the name of our band. Like it didn't really have like this deep significance. It was like, we were trying to come up with all these, I mean, it, it did cause you know, but I just feel like because my band became what it did, it just grew this like outsized significance to like what was just kind of a sweet childhood memory. Yeah. <laughs> like, so yeah, oh, it would so be embarrassing to try and explain that to her. Like, why did you blow up our relationship into this huge thing? And like, I didn't mean to. <laughs> well, I, I love talking about this because it was the same thing with Toad the Wet Sprocket. Like, he was like, yeah, it was a joke that we just use it temporarily. And then the band blew up and they had to, like, keep that name. <laughs> and I, But I was like, oh, it kind of goes with the 90s. Totally. You know, like, all, like in the 90s, bands just had yeah, weird names. Absolutely. You know? So it kind of, it, I feel like it goes and, with the theme. A lot of us had, like... A lot of us had dumb names that like, I don't think we re like, they're not dumb. Like they're dumb at the, when you name anything that you name, your band is really dumb. <laughs> Generally speaking, yeah. there are very cool, few cool band names. But then once you become, you know, sort of associated with like a song or a sound or whatever, it takes on a life of its own and it yeah. doesn't seem so dumb anymore. So, so you guys split in around 2000. <laughs> And then in 2016, got back together. Mm -hmm. So you recorded an EP, you started touring again. I remember this was like a big deal because I saw you twice on that tour because my friends in LA wanted to see you. My friends in Boston wanted to see you. And I was there for holidays. So I ended up like seeing you guys twice. Um, so I'm curious, like, how was that after not really touring with that band or recording in 16 years? Was Did you feel like you just kind of picked back up where you left off? Or was that like, like just this is mind blowing? Yeah. I mean, it, we had, oh, because we're, you know, I was married to Michael, the guitar player. Yeah. Um, we had split up. And then, you know, but Stacy, Michael, and I lived in Los Angeles. And so every time, so I would see Michael because we have children together and, I'd see Stacy because we would work together on stuff and we'd always just be like, oh, we should, we should get together and write songs. We should get together and write songs. And we would say like for years, we would say this to each other whenever we, and then for whatever reason in 2016, we actually did it. We like got together over at the Death Star, which is Michael and it was Stacy's studio is now Michael's studio in Koreatown in Los Angeles. And just like got together and like wrote for a bit and Greg started sending us ideas and just send us tapes and we'd kind of work on that. And the next thing you knew, we had songs and we were like, oh man, we should go out and play these. And the next thing you know, we booked a tour for November and then it was so much fun that we were like, see you next year in November. <laughs> and so now we've been just doing it every year ever since. That's great. So I'm, I'm glad you brought up to just being married to Michael, because I've always wondered that, you know, because as a songwriter, I mean, you write songs, obviously, about your life experiences and your relationships. And I've always wondered how that is if you're in a relationship with someone in your band or you used to be like, were there times when you were just like, oh, I'd like to write a song about our relationship, but it's weird because he's in the band. You know what I mean? That's a really good question, Rachel. You know, I I had this really 
I had a ha- habit that like, I mean, I don't know if you're, cause you're from Massachusetts. So if you're not Catholic, you know about the Irish Catholics. And I, you went to, know I went to Catholic school. That, like, right. Okay. So you know that, and also just like New Englanders, we are very like sort of embarrassed by our feelings and like, we don't like, so as a songwriter, I really took that into my songwriting. Like, I don't want you to know, like, it's none of your business what, how I feel or what my story is. Or so I really developed a habit early on, um, of using a lot of like metaphors and never really saying what I meant. So even if I was writing about him or anything, you probably wouldn't know. Cause I was like really taking another route to tell the story, like making up another story as a, as like a proxy for the story that I was really trying to tell. So like even a story, a song where most people assume it's about Michael, which is uh, co-pilot, which was on our last, uh, the last letters to Cleo record go. Um, it's really, I mean, it kind of is like I'm in touch with, I was in touch with the feeling of like being in love with this person. And, but I, it was really just like, I was incredibly depressed at the time and like Mm -hmm. doing a lot of drugs and, uh, and feeling really blue and like the happiest song in letters to Cleo history came out of that, that very dark place. And it's really not about, um, my relationship. It's about, trying to make myself feel like it's self-soothing thing, trying to make myself feel better by writing this like incredibly happy song. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, cause I've always wondered that, like you see bands like Fleetwood Mac and no doubt where, you know, they were in a relationship for a long time with somebody in the band. And, and I'm like that, you know, and then you hear song like, Oh, don't speak is about, you know, Tony and Gwen. And I'm like, how do they get up and perform that together? <laughs> You know what I mean? Right. That's, you know, I always, I always admired that, that she could, you know, I, I definitely kind of like flagged that in my, in my memory of like, just thinking, wow, it's so cool just to be able to not just to be so fearless and honest about your experience and like be vulnerable in front of people. And I'm really trying to do that more. I think I have actually written songs about the, my breakup with Michael and the breakup of our family. Um, but I don't think that it's really appropriate for Cleo. So I'll probably turn those songs into another solo record just cause I don't want, I don't want Michael to have to like, <laughs> But then again, <laughs> who knows? It could be a Cleo record. Just, would get his permission first. Well, that's what I was thinking because I don't know how, you know, I'm not a songwriter. I don't know how that works. And I'm like, that might be weird to be like, hey, I wrote lyrics to this song about us. Do you want to write a guitar part to it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Luckily for us, the guitar parts usually come first. Okay. But I would tell him, I would tell him, like the songs that I've written, um, you know, I think he would probably like them. So I don't know, maybe we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. But thank you for, it's so good to have this, this, this therapy session with you, Rachel. I love, love it. Figuring all these things out. I love it. I know. Well, I was almost like, I hope she doesn't think this is like a personal question or anything, you know, because I, it's just something I have always wondered. Um, but that, you know, that tends to be the best part of these shows. Like, it's just, you know, when people open up about what they write about, mm-hmm. um, and you know, cause when I had Glenn on from Toad, like that was like the best part of the show is he just really opened up about his depression and like writing music and how that helped him heal. And cause he went through a divorce as well. And he wrote a whole album about it. And, uh, and honestly, like listening to it back, I was mm-hmm. like, this is, this is the best part of the show, you know, cause in, you know, cause people love to hear about that. Cause we all go through stuff and you know, as artists, we, like I'm a writer. Yeah. And so, you know, as art, as artists, we write about it, you know, and we kind of, we chant a lot of times, I think you channel that energy mm-hmm. into your work. So I, I always, it's something I always like talking about. No, it's a great, and, and nothing is off the table. Let's talk about Kay's solo music. And specifically, I want to talk about Cherry Marmalade because of the 20th year anniversary. And you just did a whole tour to support this. What I thought was cool, you know, since being from Boston, right, is that um, you also played with Tanya Donnelly, right? Yep, yep. She and I have been uh, friends since, actually, since Cleo opened for Belly. And I had already, I was already such a massive Tanya fan because I love throwing muses. And, you know, so she, to me, was just like, "Ah." and I remember we opened up for Belly and I was so nervous to like 
play with them and to meet them. And like when we showed up at like sound check or maybe backstage or whatever, I'll never forget Gail Greenwood and Tanya Donnelly like ran over to me and like welcomed me. And I was just like, what? Like it was just like the most incredible thing to have them welcome me to like backstage and just say that they were so happy that we were playing with them. And anyway, I've just been friends with with uh, Tanya and Gail ever since. And so Tanya's new band, uh, Loyal Seas, they, you know, were booking dates. So I was like, hey, why don't we play together? So, of course, and that band is awesome. It's like completely different. Oh, well, I, well, I also saw Belly is actually writing new music right now. So it's funny because when I started the show, a friend of mine who's from Boston, she's come on a couple of times and she loves Tanya. And I actually never really grew up listening to Belly. I listened to the Breeders. I know she was on the first album, but my friend came on and she was like, we have to play Throwing Muses. It's this, it was Tanya Donnelly's like first band that nobody really knows about. And we played one of their songs. And then every time she would come on, she would talk about Tanya and so now I feel like I know so much about her. And then I saw you just played with her and I was like, oh my God, this is so crazy. She's like everywhere. Mm-hmm. And now they're writing a new album. So yeah, that's great. I was going to ask you how you knew her. Cause you know, Boston, Boston music chicks, you know? Um, yeah. so as far as your solo music, what prompted you, I guess, to go from letters to Cleo to releasing your own records? Did you go for a different sound, different bands? What was going on there? I was having a baby. I got pregnant. And I didn't okay. know that I was, I was not planning that, <laughs> but we had, you know, I had just gotten married and, um, and Michael went to, was going to re- Maui to record, um, and Cleo had just gotten off the road. Michael was leaving to go play on Nina Gordon's solo record in Maui. So he was going to be gone for like six weeks or two months or something like that. And, um, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to party. The husband's gone. I'm like, yeah. (laughs) And, uh, two days later I found out I was pregnant and I was like, are you what? I'm what? And, um, and so I, um, didn't have, I, you know, I, all of my friends partied and like, I I was like, I I don't, I didn't know what I was going to do. So I just like, called my sister and went over to her house in Hanover and went and had a cup of tea and was just like, eh. and she was so excited because she was six weeks pregnant by then. And we ended up being, anyway, that's a whole other story. But what I did was instead of going out and partying my ass off because my husband was going to be away, I just picked up a guitar. I took a job at the restaurant that I had always worked at, um, you know, in between tours and stuff for these people that I loved and went back to work at the restaurant, picked up a guitar and just started writing. And, um, and it was an incredibly empowering experience. I had never, you know, Cleo was very collaborative, like all five of us wrote. And, you know, even if I, you know, I wrote all the lyrics, but like, if we, even if I came in with like a part or any one of us did, we would work it out in the studio. We would in the rehearsal space. And, and, um, and so I never really spent a lot of time like by myself starting and finishing songs on my own. And, um, and because I was pregnant and I was under, I was just on this like completely different journey. Um, I found out that I had a lot to say that I didn't know that was even there. So, yeah, that was what did it. And then I went to Mike Deneen, who at Q Division, who uh, produced all the Clio records. And he was like, you got to make a record. And I was like, really? And he was like, yeah. And so we did. Yeah, oh, that's I'm learning so much today. So let's talk about the 90s. So you guys did so much in the 90s. I mean, you were in 10 Things I Hate About You. You're on the Craft soundtrack. You sang on Josie and the Pussycat. You toured with Sponge, Our Lady Peace. You guys did a lot. So I'm just curious... Do you have a favorite memory from Mm -hmm. the 90s that you look back on? You're like, oh, my God, I can't believe we did this. Oh, all of it. I mean, every single thing. I'm just like, what? This has been my life. Like, I wasn't supposed to do any of this. You know, like, nice girls from Dorchester do not do this. And so, like, so just the fact that, like, and, and I was part of, you know, I was lucky enough to be part of, like, this very short window that opened in the nineties where like 
women were leading bands and like we were on the radio we were headlining the festivals we were all crisscrossing each other across and we thought we thought like oh this is the way it's going to be forever of course it it wasn't but um but it was just such an extraordinary time uh not just for us but for or not just for fans but like for us like we knew that that we were part of something and i think it's only now that we're really seeing how how truly extraordinary that period of time was in music and you know especially in rock music and um just all the opportunities that that all of us had but that i had um that i was able to do all of these things i had no idea at the time that cuz we were all doing this stuff like we were all doing soundtracks and like and um I, I don't know. It just, it was, it's, I pinch myself. I really do. I've had an extraordinary career and I'm just like in awe a lot of the time. Well, before we wrap the show, um, I'm just going to do some quick social media plugs. So you can find Kay Hanley on Instagram at Kay Hanley, her name. It's very easy. Letters to Cleo is letters mm -hmm. underscore to underscore Cleo, which is funny. Some girl took the letters to Cleo handle and she also has postcards to Cleo. And I was like, why is everyone writing into Cleo? <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. Um, That's funny. I know. <laughs> I know. It's wild. Maybe Cleo has other pen pals. You can find Kay's music and her vinyl and her solo music on kayhanley.com. You can find my Instagram for the show at 90s Obscurity, 90s Obscurity. I post a lot of 90s throwbacks. And you can find Kay's music as well as Letters to Cleo's music on, you know, Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, wherever you get, you get your music. Kay, thank you so much for coming on. It's been wonderful. I appreciate it. Thanks, Rachel. This was such a pleasure. Of course. All right. Well, guys, go catch Kay and Letters to Cleo on the road. <laughs>